So this video is for all you Nano fans out there. And it's not gonna be another one of those really short overview videos or reviews. It's gonna be a very long deep dive in which I will share with you the inner workings of Nano and other various aspects of its history, development team, and so forth. So if you're interested at all in this project and want to hopefully learn something new, then all you have to do is just keep on watching. Hi everyone, my name is Kevin and I'm with Bitcoin for Beginners and welcome back to our channel where we hope to put out interesting and informative content during this bear market. So just real quick, if you like this video at all, if you can smash that like button and subscribe down below if you haven't already, then I would greatly appreciate that. Okay, so now let's take a look at Nano. Okay, so what is Nano on a high level? Well, it is a cryptocurrency, emphasis on the currency part, focus on peer-to-peer -peer transactions. It was formerly known as Rayblox, launched in 2015, XRB, and then rebranded on January 31st, 2018 as Nano. It is designed for speed, scalability, efficiency, and zero fees. And it is a directed acyclic graph or DAG, kind of similar to IOTA or Byteball. The main components of Nano include four parts. One, an account, which is a single address generated by your public key. Two is a block, and every block has a single transaction in it signed by your private key. Three is a ledger and that's the global set of all accounts out there, each account having its own blockchain or account chain. And four is the node and that's the software that verifies the ledger and controls any account that may be part of that node. So in the middle picture that's the ledger, that's the global set of accounts and as you can see each account have its own chain of blocks and each block is a single transaction. So all my transactions in Nano will just be updated every time I send or receive stuff down my own account chain and your transactions will affect your account chain. So the block lattice structure is a very important part of Nano, a very big and unique part of their architecture. On the right hand side, you have a visualization. Each transaction requires two parts, a send block or transaction, which deducts an amount from the sender's account balance, and a receive block or transaction, which adds that amount to the receiver's account balance. These are done separately, so the order can be determined by the receiver. So like if the receiver gets three different blocks at the same time, they can decide how to order it. And if you add and subtract it all up, it will be the same regardless. Each transaction also includes the current balance of the account. That makes it easier to prune the history because you don't have to keep all of it in history. You can just look at the top view and make sure that they match. There's also a concept of settled and unsettled transactions. And basically unsettled ones are where the received blocks are not generated yet or they haven't been signed by the receiving account. In that case, the amount is already deducted by the sender's balance, but it is still considered pending until it's signed by the receiver. So let's take a look at some of the notable processes as part of this whole system. First, you have to create an account right? And to do so, you issue an open transaction in which state you have to pick a representative. More on representatives later. Second, if you issue a send transaction, funds are immediately deducted from the sender's account and it is pending until the receiver signs a block to accept the funds and the send block is immutable once confirmed. On the other hand, receive transactions, you create a receive block once you can get something, you broadcast it to the network, and then you update your balances. Now, I also do want to note that the account balances are included in each block, like I said earlier. So that is very interesting in terms of what that lets you do in terms of pruning and other aspects of the system. So also in terms of picking representatives, these representatives are important because they can vote on your behalf and you can issue a change transaction if you want to change a representative at any time and the node or client that you use can do that for you. Now it's important to note that these representatives don't have any access to your funds. They simply vote for you in cases of forks. Anyone can be a representative, but you have to have over 0.1% of Nano supply at stake or in terms of the amount of balances that people who vote for you collectively have. Now, now, in terms of forks and voting, this is a very interesting part of the nano system because when multiple blocks claim the same prior block, that's when forks occur. However, please note that only account owners can sign blocks, right? So the only case a fork may happen is because of poor programming in terms of the client that they use or if you're trying to double spend. How nano resolves this whole issue is that representatives can choose a block to be the correct one and then they broadcast their choice to the network, listen to four periods of votes, and then they keep the winning block. That's how consensus is reached. Now, Nano also does use proof of work for all types of transactions, but it's not like Bitcoin. This is only for anti-spam, so the computation is really easy. You don't need like huge ASIC farms to do it. You can also pre-compute the proof of work for the next transaction after sending one. So this makes it feel instantaneous for the end user because you can't send out transactions faster than you compute the proof of work required for the next transaction. Now also in terms of verifying transactions, you must check for the following. If there are any duplicate transactions out on the network, if it's signed by the account owner properly, if the previous block is a 
head of the account chain, because if not, it might be a fork. Also the presence of an open block, which is the one that is required to start an account chain. And also that the computed hash meets the proof of work requirements. Now, how was Nano distributed? Because if you can recall, it is pre-mined. It isn't distributed by like proof of work or minor rewards. The max supply is over 133 million Nano. It was distributed by faucets by people solving CAPTCHAs manually until October 17th, 2017. The distribution rate was roughly 17,000 Nano per hour. And that changed over time, I believe, but it stopped after 39% was distributed. And the dev team kept 7 million, which is roughly 5% for their dev fund. And the rest was burned. Now, in terms of current distribution, here is a Nano rich list I got from nanofaucet.org. And as you can see, it is top heavy. The accounts or addresses that have 100,000 to 1 million Nano or even higher carries roughly 24.5%, 20.9%, and 21% respectively speaking. Now, to be fair, many other major coins are top heavy as well. So this is something to keep in mind instead of just docking Nano for this. Now, in terms of their team, they're led by Colin and he has a lot of experience in the development world and they have brought on other developers and not only for the protocol, but also for infrastructure for mobile wallets and also for community managers, legal, biz dev, etc. A very interesting group. And I think I agree with Charlie Lee when he took a look at the project and said that the dev team has their head screwed on straight and aren't just doing this for Lambos and financial gain. Now, in terms of their roadmap, they have a really complete and I really like the roadmap because they create a whole website for it and you can look at it on nano.org, but they kind of detail what they're going to do in terms of adoption roadmap, wallets roadmap, protocol roadmap. They talk about the summary and their plan for each one and also the challenges that they will face and the progress they've made so far. So I really like their format and how much time they spent making this roadmap because other projects, they just put like really high level infographics and that's not really helpful at all. That doesn't give me confidence as a prospective investor on if they're going to be able to make actual progress and be held accountable. Now, just diving into some parts of the roadmap in terms of adoption, they're going to be building out a cloud infrastructure for vendors, exchanges, merchants, and other nano service providers so they can more easily integrate nano into their business and workflow without having to set up all the infrastructure themselves. They're also going to create plug and play point of sale tools and solutions for merchants to accept nano. This is really important if they want mom and pop shops and food trucks and businesses just on the streets accepting nano. They're also increasing fiat on ramp options for nano, which is of course important because it makes it way easier for people interested in investing or using to get their hands on some. And finally, they're building out communities across the world, but they specifically list Asia and South America places of interest and focus because that is one of the big criticisms that they have no name recognition or barely any outside of the Western world. In terms of their protocol roadmap, they have already completed universal blocks, which is kind of consolidating their four different types of transactions, send, receive, change, and open into a single type of block. This will make it more efficient and allow for more aggressive pruning to make the amount of data that needs to be stored by nodes much smaller. They're also gonna work on ledger pruning in the future in which you only have to keep the head block and a few behind it instead of a long history of each account chain in the ledger, which gets quite bloated after a while. And finally, vote distribution. They have an effort to make Nano more decentralized in terms of the number of representatives out there. They've already made a lot of progress so far since earlier 2018, but they have a lot of work to do. And this is one that is wanted by all crypto coins to become more decentralized because after all, that's the whole point of cryptocurrency. Oh, and I forgot to mention that there's also a security audit that they're doing via Hacker One, in which they're getting white hat hackers to audit everything top to bottom for them. And hopefully they'll be able to catch certain bugs before malicious hackers find out if any are out there. So what are some of the advantages that I see for this project? Well, first of all, it's community passion. They have a really passionate community, especially on Reddit. And this has gotten listings on exchanges by voting and even merchants to adopt it by people just asking them constantly, please accept Nano. We want you to accept Nano. Never underestimate a passionate and loyal community and fan base. They also have a really active team, which has great communications, constant updates on Telegram, on their blogs, and they're accessible. They answer questions and so forth. So definitely a very strong team that will keep you up to date, but also work hard and has their head screwed on straight. And furthermore, this is kind of an umbrella advantage in terms of their focus on usability because they are wanting to be a super fast, scalable, free, and energy efficient cryptocurrency to use. And this was a really strong selling point at a time during the last bull market when other crypto coins had problems with all of the above. And this was a really big selling point and drawing point for the Nano project. Of course, no project is perfect. So let's do take a look at some of their disadvantages. First of all, is marketing and brand rec, and they do know this. So this is something that they have been working on and will continue to work on in the future, because especially outside of Western countries, not many know them and not many use them. Also growing pains. If you guys have remembered, exchanges have struggled to implement nodes and their architecture properly. This has caused withdrawal and deposit delays galore and has caused some investors to become impatient with the project. Also disillusioned BitGrill investors. If you guys don't remember the Big 
grill hack and subsequent fiasco. This has caused many people to become disillusioned with the project and not want to touch Nano in the future, even though that's probably not the fault of the team. Finally, there's no protocol level incentives to run nodes because if you remember, you have to run nodes completely free. You don't get any block rewards for like kind of verifying things and making sure that the network is running properly, unlike in Bitcoin you do. So the main incentive that the team themselves have said is that if you're like a business or like an exchange and you want to utilize Nano or integrate it with your products and services, then you'll have an incentive to run a node to make sure the network goes well. Of course, that does make sense, but that isn't as strong as an incentive as much as like financially incentivizing them to run nodes directly from the protocol level. So of course, I know many of you guys probably don't want to hear about the BitGrill hack again, but there's no deep dive in Nano that would be complete without it because after all, we do talk about Mt. Gox years after it and its effect on Bitcoin. So 15 million XRB or Ray blocks at the time was stolen from the exchange, $150 million worth at that time. It was announced in early February of 2018. And basically Francisco Ferrano, the founder of BitGrill, had a whole drama with the Nano core team blaming each other. He asked them for a hard fork and the Nano team rejected the proposal, of course, because that's the only reasonable thing to do. And they have said that it's not a protocol issue rather than with BitGrill software or implementation. There's also this whole issue with the Block Explorer timestamps because remember the Nano protocol doesn't include timestamps, but nodes that receive them can place a timestamps themselves. And so that's how the Block Explorers were made from some nodes timestamps. And they had problems in terms of empty timestamps that made it difficult to debug, like when the hack happened, how it happened and who was involved. And so that was a whole misunderstanding and fiasco for that. And this has caused many lawsuits and Italian authorities involved because Big Grill and Francisco Ferrano is based in Italy. And class action lawsuits, I believe against both sides, the Nano Core team and Big Grill. So of course there's many different parts of this hack and I did a lot of reading into it, but it's still not conclusive like what exactly happened, who is at fault and who is to share the blame for this. Now, moving on to more cheery suspects. In terms of adoption, there are many merchants. You can take a look at the merchant directory at usenano.org, over a hundred plus. Now, admittedly, most of them are small shops, very niche, very mom and pop, but as always, you gotta start somewhere, right? And as fervent as the community is, I have no doubt that they're gonna continue to get more adoption just by word of mouth, just by pushing companies to do so. So hats off to the Nano community for getting so far, and they should continue to take the same path. Another instant of community power adoption is Brain Blocks, and this was built back in the day when Nano was Ray Blocks by a very big fan of Nano in the community, and he built a easy checkout app and solution for Nano, which makes it easy for companies to accept Nano. Of course, another very promising aspect and has been adopted by merchants wanting to integrate Nano into their checkout system. Now, in terms of wallets, they have made a lot of progress on this lately. They have online wallet options, mobile app wallet options, desktop options, and even hardware wallet options in terms of the Ledger Nano S. Now, I personally haven't used most of those. I've tried out the Node and Developer Wallet, a previous version though, and I can't say that they have some growing pains for that because I had problems getting it to work properly in terms of syncing and whatnot. But that was an older version and haven't used it or checked it lately, so it might have been solved since then. They've also have made a ton of effort in terms of exchanges. The whole reason why the BitGrill hack happened is because in the old days and last year when Rayblox was rocketing, they had barely any access. They only had shady exchanges like Mercatox, BitGrill, and maybe like Gate.io or whatnot. But now because of the community, they've gotten listed on KuCoin, Binance, and other big ones with a lot more legit volume. So thank you everybody for watching. That was it. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive and learned a lot about Nano, one of the most popular projects by grassroots cryptocurrency enthusiasts in the crypto space. So if you can support me once again by smashing that like button, let me know what you think in the comments below and also subscribe if you haven't already. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. This is Kevin and I'll catch you guys next time.